Should men dominate women? Should husbands take dominion of their wives? If you start in this granular location, you actually find, you scratch things, that there are some serious differences out there in the Christian world today. Welcome to Grace and Truth. My name is Owen Strand. I'm going to be your host. Please subscribe to this podcast on all platforms. I am joined today by my dear friend, Grant Castleberry. He is a senior pastor of Capital Community Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the president of Unashamed Truth Ministries. And I think he is our only six-time guest. We're sending him a plaque in the mail. Grant, welcome back. Man, it's good to be back. Uh, I'm not sure six times. Maybe, maybe this is the fourth time. But anyway, I love coming on your show. So appreciate you. And man, this is a kind of a, a return back to where we were 10 years ago, where we worked with the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. You were the president. I was the executive director. And we were we were like Andy Griffith and and, and Barney Fife. <laughs> I, I can find a better example, but we were we were like uh, Batman and Robin tag teaming issues related to biblical manhood and womanhood. And so you and I have been at this for a long time. So obviously a subject that you and I have have talked about in depth yes. and and studied extensively and talked in churches across the country and even even all over the world about issues related to manhood and womanhood. So we have uh, obviously we're still learning. We're still studying God's word. But but I think this is an area that you and I can both both speak to. That's exactly right. And I so appreciate you being on. And I was thinking the same thoughts this morning, driving in, getting getting things together, because here we are uh, some 10, 12 years after we were working on a lot of these issues. And we've got challenges on all sides, just like we did a decade ago when we were at CBMW. We've got what is called uh, soft complementarity, which is squishy and and frankly not good for, for a whole lot of anything, sadly. And then th the newer challenge we have, and this was a much smaller speck on the horizon uh, 10 years ago, now it looms a lot larger, is um, – Mm, a form of patriarchy, let's call it that, because we want to be charitable. We're not on these two episodes. We're doing two together. Going to lump everybody in as if everybody on either side is exactly the same. There's actually a lot of variance uh, on the weaker side, and there's a lot of variance on the stronger side. And there's some folks who encourage us more or less on the weaker and some who encourage us more or less on the stronger. But basically, Grant, exactly what you said. We've got a ton of confusion today, and we have a rising generation, I would even say. I want to hear how you would reflect on this just sociologically for a minute before we dive into texts. I think the confusion has actually increased in the last 10 years. And I think the younger generation uh, have more and more grown up in broken homes. And a good number of them, for example, coming into the church, have no idea what man-woman relationships are supposed to look like outside of marriage or in marriage. And I think that has actually led, as feminism has gotten stronger and worse, and it is a real specter in America, I think that has actually led to an overcorrection on the part of a lot of youngsters who come in and go, we're not going to be feminist. That's all we really need to be. We need to be biblical. And, and they actually end up overcorrecting. What are you seeing with the younger generation today? That's a great astute observation. You know, I think 10 years ago, when you and I were working with CBMW, we viewed ourselves as really, I think we thought of ourselves as on the far right of the spectrum in terms of roles related to manhood and womanhood, in terms of where complementarianism as a movement was going. We, we thought of ourselves as holding the line in terms of really understanding what male leadership is, male headship, because we were seeing the inroads that feminism was making even within the evangelical church. And it has made huge inroads yeah. with so many denominations going egalitarian and then as eventually where, where egalitarianism leads to affirming LBGTQ, you know, the alphabet soup and, and everything else. And so you and I saw that trajectory and we saw that trajectory even within the complementarian movement where this new label of soft complementarianism uh, arose, which is really just egalitarianism in disguise in many ways. Yeah. It's, it's, it's essentially, it affirms male headship in name only, but it looks almost exactly like egalitarianism. So you and I saw that. We saw the dangers of that. We saw conversations like, well, you know, your elder board needs to be having 
uh, women in the elder meeting yep. uh, to to defer to and essentially making women de facto elders, uh, that it's fine for women to preach to men on a Sunday morning. You know, we've seen the the panorama of soft complementarianism and the dangers that it poses. And so you're right with a new generation of young men, they are seeing that in the church and they are saying, I do not want any part of that. That is not biblical. And I I'm going to, you know, in some ways, uh, swing the opposite direction. And as we are prone to do, sometimes we swing too far. So that being said, I think you and I, you, you mentioned uh, patriarchy, which just means male rule. I mean, you and I would affirm male rule that the meaning of kephale means headship, leadership, that men are to lead, men are to, to rule. But in some ways, the, the movement that is patriarchy has swung too far. And we can yeah. talk more about what that looks like. But Yeah, no, that's very well said. Fundamentally, you've got three major camps here in the evangelical world. You've got egalitarianism that argues that men and women can both be pastors and elders in the church, and men and women share headship in the home, really. And then there's no, certainly no distinction between men and women in, in broader society. You've got complementarians who argue that men and women are equal in God's image. Men are not better than women. Women are not better than men. But nonetheless, in the home, the husband is the head of his wife. And in the church, men are called to be elders and preachers and teachers of the church. And then in society, the strong complementarians would say there's a general pattern of male leadership in society. It's not quite as uh, nailed down in the New Testament. And yet we would say that the patriarchy camp would agree with complementarians in what I just said, but would concentrate more. Uh, it's more a, a, a distinction of, of degree than major difference. But um, the patriarchy side would say men rule in the home, as you said. And, and so it, it's not so much that there's a different idea. It's the same idea, headship. But there is a stronger form of headship on the patriarchy side. Um, and, and there are different uh, applications then that, that apply in different ways. And someone like me is going to want to say that complementarity, especially what you and I would call strong complementarity, it's been called broad complementarity. Uh, complementarity, I think, does the best justice to both men and women. And that's what I, I want to hear you reflect on this as well. But uh, in just a sec, I love that complementarity especially as lined out by Piper and Grudem and some others in the 80s and then following, but really practiced for, for centuries, even millennia in the church. I love that it captures uh, the, the rightful role of both the man and the woman. It's not that the man in, in our vision of, of Scripture, trying to harvest it from Scripture, is not very much an authority. He is an authority. But the woman's gifts matter. The woman's role matters tremendously. And I fear today, Grant, that we're, we're almost seeing some of that uh, the goodness of femininity a little bit uh, played down or even eclipsed in some circles. Thoughts? Absolutely. I think I think by and large, many, you know, if you were sitting down with somebody who proudly wears the patriarchalist badge, they would say, "Well, I affirm the gifts of women. I want to I want to see flourishing." So there would be there would be that affirmation, but within complementarity, there's that real emphasis. Uh, that that degree of 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 really desiring not just to say okay well well men are to lead and, and and not leaving it at that but also saying well what has God gifted women to do and how should women utilize their gifts within the family within the church and in some cases uh, outside the home and and how can they flourish and how can they use those gifts you know for example at at, at capital my church that I pastor, we have every month a elder led prayer meeting and it's a pastor or an elder. One of the, one of the pastors of the church that leads the prayer meeting who stands up, up in front and, and, and guides and directs the prayer meeting. I think that's biblical according to first Timothy two, but during that prayer meeting, we have uh, men and women read scripture and, and pray and I think that's a consistent practice when you when you look at the the especially in Corinthians, and, and how men and women would um, publicly, sometimes 
read scripture and pray within the context of the church. So I think having that place, a, a good place for women to utilize their gifts, whether it's teaching other women in the church, as, as Paul instructs Titus in Titus chapter two, uh, teaching the younger women to love their husbands, to, to love their children, uh, teaching the, the children is, is an important thing. You know, I, I, I've heard of, of some churches that don't even allow women to teach the young children. Mm-hmm. And I think you're missing something there because uh, women often are more intuitive in terms of the needs of a child and are often better gifted yeah. to be able to relate to to a young elementary age child. So I, I would say unleash those women mm-hmm. in your church and utilize them to use their teaching gifts and uh, you're going to be better off for it. So I think complementarianism gets that mm-hmm. where sometimes uh, patriarchalism does not. In complementarity, there is uh, a strong focus with regard to headship on the image of Jesus Christ. And we think of Ephesians 5, kind of the locus classicus of this whole discussion of what male headship looks like and what female submission looks like. And something I think we need to say, you were pushing into this a minute ago, but is this is this is going to be an overlapping vision with what is called red pill manhood or womanhood. But this is also going to be a very distinct vision. Um, and, and here I'm verging into slightly other territory as well, not just the intra evangelical discussion uh, with the, the kind of cultural kickback against feminism. Um, There has been a really strong emphasis on men being sort of king of their home and the patriarchy crowd, at least some of it has very much fastened onto that and said, that's, that's it. That's good. Some of them have offered critiques of the red pill sphere, but nonetheless, there is an overlap there. And some women in that uh, world have, have said, I want to be a trad wife. There's been a kind of secular recovery of trad wife status. And that has also uh, influenced women in the church, at least professing women. What we need to be very clear about, though, today, and and this is part of why I wanted to dial up this podcast and talk at length about it, not just one episode, but two, is that we bring the Christ church paradigm to the male female relationship to to the husband wife relationship specifically. And in Ephesians 5 29, we read this for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of of his body. Grant, I want to put this on record and and hear your response. I am concerned that in the red pill world, and then in some corners of the patriarchy world, where, for example, men are now telling us that it's good that they dominate their wife, or Andrew Torba and Andrew Isker have called for men, for husbands to take dominion of their wife and children. Um, I'm really concerned because I don't necessarily see Christ as the exemplar of the headship that is supposed to be practiced. We are not looking to some military figure, some impressive man with, you know, bulging muscles on an Instagram account as our exemplar. We can we can see some truth maybe in common grace sense out there. We can. But fundamentally, whatever headship is supposed to be practiced and whatever submission is supposed to be offered, fundamentally, that is to God, first and foremost, not any person. And and the headship is is formed by the image of the one who lays down his life for his bride and then ongoingly seeks to nourish and cherish her. And I'm going to cut it straight here in conclusion of this thought to turn it over to you. I'm not hearing a whole lot of nourish and cherish in the patriarchy camp that is urging men to dominate their wife. Thoughts? So, you know, you and I talked for years in years with egalitarians about the meaning of kephale, which is the word that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter five for the the husband for Christ, which which means it's translated head. And it's clear from the ancient manuscripts. I mean, Wayne Grudem did a whole study on this, utilizing every, every facet of how the word was used in the ancient world. It means leader. So it's very clear that men are called to lead in their home. And and I think what you're what you're getting at is there's a way that our culture is, is telling young men to lead, which is in a domineering kind of brute force machoism that is unchristlike. 
And then there's the way that Paul and, and Christ model leadership. And so just in terms of thinking through that, several several angles, I think, that we need to look at. One, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 that the head of every man is Christ. So the man is under the authority of Christ. Hmm. You're the head of your household, but you are under, you as a man are under the authority of Christ. And that means that everything that you do should be Christ-like, that you should lead in love and compassion and 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 mercy and and there should be uh, a tenderness as as you were just talking about a, a nurturing of your wife and then secondly the the leadership that a man is to um, to view in terms of his wife is a leadership in terms of one who is his helper mm. not not a child or not somebody who is 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 um, there's a distinction that that even Solomon makes in the Proverbs where he instructs both the, the father and the mother to to exercise discipline and, and, and teaching roles in the lives of their children. Yeah. The, the wife is the helper of the husband. And so even though there is a headship and a submission relationship, the relationship is is not one of really master and servant. It's a master of, of partnership in which the husband's called to lead, the wife is called to submit to that leadership. And that's the third thing I would say is that when you read the New Testament, it's always the the wives who are instructed to submit to their own husbands, mm. to their own husbands, not just to men in general, right. but to their own husbands. And it's not a call to husbands to make their wives submit. Mm. And I always tell that to young couples that I'm counseling. I tell that to people in our church. I say, ladies, listen, it it doesn't matter what type of leader your husband is. He could be John Wayne. He could be <laughs> Bill Belichick. He, he could be a great leader. I threw that in there because you're, you're a New Englander. Absolutely. But he could be a great leader. But if you're not willing to follow him, you're not going anywhere. Mm. And the call to submit, First Peter chapter 3, you know, Peter says, you're like Sarah, you know, if you submit to your husband, who, you know, who called her husband Lord, who submitted to his, his leadership. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, which you just referenced, wives, submit to your own husbands and the Lord. The imperative is always given to the wife to submit to the husband. So I would just say, mm -hmm. young men, if you're out there and you're trying to dominate your wife or, you know, I know that that's probably a far an extreme example, but if you're exercising a headship that is, is, uh, overbearing, then you're not going to get very far with your wife. What you need to do is pray and, and ask her to be willing to, to follow your leadership yeah, and to tenderly lead her into that, but lead nonetheless, you're, you're called to lead. We're right. not calling, we're not saying that you're to lay down your leadership as much as soft complementarian. That's what soft complementarianism has done right. is it said, well, you just affirm whatever your wife wants yep. and that's servant leadership. That's not what I'm saying at all, but I'm saying you lead in a tender, compassionate, loving way. And also that you listen to your wife. Mm. She's your helper. And, and I, I talk to guys sometimes uh, who, who don't do a good job of listening to their wives and their wives are giving them good guidance, good wisdom. Mm -hmm. And they get in trouble in a business situation or a spiritual situation or a situation with their kids because they weren't listening to their helper. Their, their is there, their, their wife, who, whom God has given them mm -hmm. to, to get them to be uh, better men of God. So I would just, I, I affirm uh, what you're saying, leadership, but we need to think about what that leadership looks like. Hey, we'll be back to the conversation in just a minute, but I need to talk to you about something very important. At the very heart of our democracy lies a principle we hold sacred, free speech. It's the cornerstone that supports every freedom we cherish. Yet in today's digital age, discussions about our wealth, our rights, and our future are being silenced or overshadowed in mainstream narratives that leave many feeling voiceless in conversations crucial to our financial independence and security. This is where wealth protection research steps in, armed with a mission that has never been more critical. Wealth protection research is not a financial advisory firm. They're defenders of free speech, yes to free speech, committed to giving a voice to the silence. 
Wealth Protection Research tirelessly seeks out financial experts. These are the voices that challenge prevailing narratives, especially as we navigate the uncertainties of the 2024 election. Wealth Protection Research has created a 2024 Election Wealth Protection Report. This free report highlights the three best ideas for protecting and growing your money heading into the 2024 election. It contains ideas the mainstream media won't touch, and listeners can get it completely free. Don't you love those words? Completely free. Text IDEAS, one word, IDEAS, to 76626 to claim your free copy. If you believe in the sanctity of free speech and the importance of financial freedom, then act now. Again, text Ideas, just one word, to 76626 to claim your free copy of this 2024 election protection report. It's time to widen the scope of what we're told, to hear the ideas uh, the establishment does not think you can handle, and to take control of our financial destinies. How important is this? Text Ideas to 76626 to claim your free copy. Now back to our conversation. We absolutely do. Uh, you've quoted First Peter 3, another very important text. First Peter 3, 5. This is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. There it is clear as day. It's not submitting to all men. By submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. On, on social media, you'll get guys who, again, I think in a lot of cases, are, are reacting and overreacting, and women doing this too, actually, interestingly. They're overreacting to feminism, and they're going the opposite way. And they're even reading a passage like this with, with a good desire, let's say. A lot, of, a lot of what we're talking about here on both sides, I think there, there are some good desires. There's also some, some sin definitely in the mix. But there can be a desire to kick back against feminism and recover scripture and, hey, she's calling him Lord and she's obeying him. But the thing is, as you rightly drew out there, she she calls Abraham Lord. It's not that Abraham says, woman, call me Lord or else. And you said that, you know, some young men can struggle with this grant. Let's just let's just put it this way. Every young man and every man struggles in some way as a husband. In actuality, I think a lot of us men and women, men are not worse sinners than women, but a lot of us on one on one day we're this we're in this area bad, and in another day we're on the opposite side. So one day we're too strong, the other day we're too soft, or one week or one month or whatever it may be. My point is this the Bible gives us instruction as if a lot of people are not going to be hitting the mark and all of us fail in these respects. Today, I think we've got a lot of we've got a lot of men who don't lead, who are scared to lead. We've got a lot of women who have imbibed feminist lies and they're too strong. They're just straight up too strong and they're effectively cowing their husband. And that is a huge problem. But the solution to that is not then to hit a button and make the woman mute and never saying anything and he never listens to her and instead he rises up in strength and becomes Lord and and um, and then he's domineering. The biblical balance is calibrated by the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the example for the man and honestly, Grant, we couldn't get a more challenging example. Praise God that we have grace to meet that mark. Man, that's so well stated, Owen. I, I so appreciate what you just said. I mean, this is to get this right requires God's grace, God's strength, and God's help. I, I was just as you were talking, I was thinking about when you, myself, and Gavin Peacock were down doing that men's conference in the Dominican Republic. And and you and I were up there with Miguel Nunez in front of thousands of men, thousands of men. And we were doing a Q&A and I'll never forget, Gavin got one of the hardest questions that you could you could possibly get. Miguel threw it out. He said, OK, Gavin, what do you do if your wife will not submit to your leadership? Mm. 
And I think there's some men in that situation totally. where they're trying to lead, they're trying to be, they're trying to be biblical leaders. And maybe they were saved after they got married and their wife is a non-Christian. And she's, she, you know, the, the liberalizing of women is a completely separate conversation, but that's a reality that, that men are becoming more conservative. Women are becoming by and large more liberal. Mm -hmm. So you might be in this situation. And, and so here Gavin is, handed this question. What do you do if your wife won't submit to your leadership? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, you take a towel and you wash her feet, just like Christ washed the feet of the disciples in the upper room. In other words, you serve her, you, you love her, mm. you serve her, but you, you, you maintain that Christ likeness and you you call her and woo her to follow your leadership, but you, you don't. If you force it and demand it, it, it will not happen, or it will be done begrudgingly. You have to allow that work of the Holy Spirit in her heart, in her life, for her to to come alongside you. And for you know, in some situations, unfortunately, that might be a long time coming. Yeah. Because God has to do a mighty work of sanctification in the heart of the woman to bring her to that place where she really is truly going to follow her husband's leadership. But by God's grace, nothing is impossible with God. And I think that was Gavin's point. You get there by serving, by humbly leading, not by forcing, coercing. That is such an important point. And I think there's a fair number of young couples out there who are rightly rejecting feminism and wokeness and passive manhood. All of that is good, beta manhood, but but they are leaping out of one ditch and into the other. And in the first year or so of marriage, there's great photos on social media and smiling and trad wife recovery and all these sorts of things. And And he's my strong provider. But what can happen over time is that that can wear you down on both ends and domineering, overbearing uh, headship, which is not really headship, um, man, that'll take a toll. And that's what I fear in this conversation, Grant. I fear there's a lot of energy right now in directions to reject cultural lies, which is good. But ultimately, this will burn off if it's not grounded in Scripture. The mark is not reacting against the culture. It in any area of our theology and spirituality, the mark is where scripture has it. There's a bad form of servant leadership uh, that you critiqued a few minutes ago, and I share in that critique. Um, there's sometimes called servant leadership that that um, that that smacks of what you were just talking about in a positive way, where a man does model godliness, and sometimes people call that servant leadership, and that's all they reduce headship to is just walking around serving your family. That's why you and I wouldn't um, use that term as some use it. We'd say there is the serving, but then there's also the genuine leading because God has given the man authority. But but we don't want to miss that serving part. I, I think along the lines, as you were talking of Matthew 20, uh, 25, but Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. This sounds a lot like red pill manhood today, by the way, almost exactly like it. Verse 26, it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So you and I are not saying all, I'm just going to repeat myself. All manhood reduces to as a leader or all a pastor does is walk around performing acts of kindness. There's a lot of leading to do. There's a lot of decision making in the home. There's a lot of planning. All of that is very much in the mix with your wife. But there's there's genuine authority there. But if there isn't this spirit, this Christ like spirit grant, we can't say that there's genuine headship being exercised, genuine leadership, can we? Hey, got to jump out of our conversation for just a minute to talk about something very, very important. Endless doom scrolling on your TV platform to try to find entertaining content. You've been there. I've been there. 30 minutes passes, an hour passes, perhaps even two hours pass, and then you just fall asleep and you end up watching nothing. 
I have a better way forward for you. Hillsdale College is offering more than 40 free online courses in the most important and enduring subjects. You can learn about the works of C.S. Lewis, the stories in the book of Genesis, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution, the rise and fall of the Roman Republic, because we're all thinking about the Roman Empire on a daily basis, or the history of the ancient Christian church with Hillsdale College's online courses, all available for free. That's right. For free. I personally recommend you sign up for a great course, Winston Churchill and Statesmanship. In this six lecture course, Hillsdale College President Dr. Larry Arn, one of the world's foremost scholars of Churchill, explores how Winston Churchill defended constitutional government against the unique dangers of totalitarian government and modern warfare. The course is self-paced so that you can start whenever and wherever you fall asleep some night after a long day at work, you can start it up the next day. Start your free course, Winston Churchill and Statesmanship with Dr. Larry Arn today. Fantastic opportunity before you. Go right now to hillsdale.edu slash grace to start. It's free. It's easy to get started. That's hillsdale.edu slash grace. One word to start. Hillsdale.edu slash grace. Let's jump back into the conversation. That's right. That's right. And, and the importance here, as you've emphasized, and, and I try to emphasize as a pastor, is to be biblical. Is to, and, and by the way, the Bible will win the day. Mm. Because in 20 years, what will Christians be going to? They're always going back to Ad Fontes. They're always going back to the Word of God. They're always going back to the source. And the Holy Spirit is constantly guiding and directing the church back to his word. So where, where you want to be is, is with the Bible. Yes. And, and I think you and I have been trying to say the same thing for a long time, but we've been trying to say it in a biblical way. And for so long, we were saying, but men are called to lead. Yeah. You know, men are, men are called to lead. And that was being... That was being maligned and, and pushed against and, and called abusive. Yep. And and then I think now the the pushback is, well, men aren't called to, to serve. And, and we are called to to lay down our lives for for our wives. That's what that's what Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter five, that the that the man's role is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So that leadership that that men are called to is a Christ-like leadership. So the key here is not to swing the pendulum. The key is, as it always is with, with any controversy, is to go back to the scriptures and land where the Bible lands. Because really, if if we go to 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 the extremes of of patriarchy, which which by the way, maybe it would be helpful to talk about some of the things that are being asserted by patriarchy. Yes, and and this wouldn't be by by all means everyone, but things like it is it is always a sin for a woman to work outside the home might be one of the assertions. Women of, voting as well. Of, Women, women exercising their right to, to vote, even in terms of education, that the education of, of, of a woman is not as important as the education of a man, things, things like that. I'm not, I'm not saying that every, everybody advancing patriarchy is saying that, but I'm saying some are. Yes. And, and so uh, swinging the pendulum that way is not healthy for the family. It's not healthy for the church and it's just not biblical. So we right. always want to be by his grace, biblical and, and to land where the Bible lands. And there's real health there. Um, yes. What is good in this world is God's will. Mm. Always. Mm. What is good and beautiful and true is God's will. Yes. So you always want to be in the center of God's will because we're the, we're, when you're in the center of God's will, there's flourishing. And this is, and so that's why I, I am a happy complementarian because I think true complementarity, the way that Grudem and Piper and Tom Schreiner and your father-in-law, Bruce Ware, and many others articulated it, you know, in, in terms of, of, of that generation is where the, I think that's the biblical position. Yeah. So I want to keep landing there. That's where I plan on being in 50 years. Yes. And I think that leads to flourishing for both men and women. Yeah, we're going to talk in our next episode about some of those trappings of patriarchy and what is sometimes called family integrated uh, church 
um, we're going to overlap in a lot of ways with some folks who would be in those camps. Uh, and we've got freedom on some issues to disagree and, and take some different positions. We'll talk more about that next episode, because there's a lot of things that have come come back with a vengeance in recent years that have shocked many of us. Head coverings. Does a woman have to wear a, a you know, kind of little shawl like head covering today? Well, there were like four people who argued that 20 years ago when I was in seminary. And now there's a lot of energy toward that. That's something I think we can we can differ over and have some different views on. But we will talk about those sort of matters next episode. Before we wrap this one, before we conclude, I just want to say a word along the lines of what Grant just reiterated and what Matthew 20 is after. And so I want to say to men, just a direct word and then grant any last conclusion concluding, conclusioning word from you, <laughs> just created a word. It is not simping. It is not effeminate. It is not bad or wrong or weak for a man to love his wife and love his family through acts of service. And, and I'm, I'm concerned that there is a kind of appropriation of kingly language and, and thinking where you would end up, uh, you might be trying to recover something biblical, as we're saying, that's good, but you might overcorrect, that's happening all over the place, and you might think that a man getting down on his hands and knees and washing feet, as you talked about Gavin Peacock saying, uh, a, a man doing exactly what Jesus did at the Last Supper with his disciples, you might, you might be in a bad place. And you might think that's simpish, as they say online, or that's weak, or that's a cuck thing to do, or anything along those lines. And I want to issue a warning to young men, and I want to issue a warning to husbands, and I want to just say, we can overdo this, and we can think that um, the wife serves, and the wife does the even the home stuff, and we have no part to play there. In, in my own home, I'm guessing in yours, Grant, my wife is the homemaker and she does the, the lion's share of those things. But I actually want my kids to see me being humble, serving my family, and just genuinely putting them above me in ways that express humility. That's not all fatherhood is. That's not all headship is. That's not all being a husband is. There's a lot more to talk about. And we've talked about some of that and we'll keep talking about it. But let's just not do the red pill thing where you think you're being some kind of alpha king, I guess to the glory of God, when the head of the church is the one who washed his disciples' sweaty, stinky first century feet. So be careful of overcorrecting on this count. Last words from you, Grant. Well, that's well said. I would just say to, to young guys out there, you want to be strong. You want to you wanna be a leader. Don't be like the culture saying and be weak and be passive and and right. all those things. But at the same time, you also want to be tender and compassionate. Don't lose your kids. Mm. Love your kids. It's not it's not unmanly to to give your kids a hug yes. and to 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 love your wife and write your wife a love note or a poem. I mean, it's that is that is good yes. and and that is a wonderful thing. So don't lose the joy of your family, of your kids. Love them. You never know when when one of them is going to be taken yeah. away or if, if the Lord's going to take you away. Yeah. So just every day, it's a gift. Love your kids. Laugh. Be humble. Don't, you know, just thank thank God for the gifts that you have and 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 be be Christ like. So that's that's all Amen. I would say. All I Amen. would add. All of this by the grace of God. Thank you so much to Grant Castleberry for a fantastic biblical reflection and engagement in this episode. Um, our prayer is not that that there would be some kind of online war one between this faction or that, but that young men and young women would thrive and flourish and that the children that are then um, brought into the world, they would be under a loving, kind, strong father and a loving, kind, godly, submissive mother. So that's our prayer. Thank you for listening to this episode of Grace and Truth. God bless you.